Yeah, so Yancy and Sally, why don't you join us up here on the stage? And uh, in 2007, Sally, I, knowing your background as a foreign correspondent and as a journalist in some of the world's uh, trouble spots, yes. um, I feared that you may have been in one of those yes. in 2007, <laughs> which was, you can tell us a little bit about that. And Yancy, we're really looking forward to you telling us um, so much about how you got Kickstarter started. So, I guess in 2007, I was based in Cairo. It was before the revolution in Cairo, um, and was responsible for coverage of all of the Middle East, including the Iraq War. So, um, I think from that time to this time, there's a couple things. I, I found a lot of resonance in what. So after I did that, I, I, I went to what is probably as far away from that as you could possibly do, which is to be Washington Bureau Chief for the AP. Did that for a couple of years through two presidential cycles and um, now I'm based in New York. I think that there's just been so much change, so much of it bewildering, but also so much of it deeply optimistic in journalism and so much of it completely tied to digital transformation, um, technology. I found a lot of resonance in a lot of what Paul said about how journalists actually use technology these days. I think it is so different than it used to be. I kind of think there was a time back in 2007 where you thought of data as like this sort of you know rabbit hopping around the newsroom or something, right? It was a thing, right? And what I have found the most transformative is that ordinary journalists now use technology and, 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 and use data just simply as one of the other tools in their reporting toolbox. I mean, I, we tried a couple of years ago in Washington to just completely try to demystify this as much as possible. You have tools as a person trying to get information. Those tools include your ability to get people to talk to you, and they include the ability to look at numbers and other information and get information, usable information of that. Um, I still think there's some work to be done on that. I think that there still is a little bit of a, I'm fascinated by um, one of the grants. I know Columbia has worked really hard to try to get the connection between you know, what you think of as people who understand news and journalism and people who can use technology. And when I go out and talk to people at schools or, or whatever, I say that's what needs to be focused on, right? I mean, that is the real critical thing. In some newsrooms, there still are divides between the people in one corner who can code and the people who have the news instincts. But everything that we've been trying to do the last 10 years has been to break down that, that boundary and, and create cohesive teams where people are teaching other th this stuff because it's, it really makes a huge difference. We have a story on The Wire today, on our app today, that's about um, a hospital in, a, 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 a psychiatric hospital in Hawaii that has a really big walk away problem. And somebody walked away and, and, and did a, a bad crime. And, you know, I don't think that my state reporters based in Honolulu 10 years ago were using data to break news. And, and now they are. And that's just such an important breakthrough because that means that, and it's not just, you know, us, it's, 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 who are, if anybody went to the Committee to Protect Journalists dinner last night, a, a lone blogger with a little bit of training in Yemen who can, who can be an important voice of information for her country um, now in London. So I, I think there's a lot of negative things happening in the media. Obviously, the rise of fake news is an incredibly difficult challenge for all of us. But there's a ton of, I feel very optimistic personally. So what I heard there was not just tools, but but culture change. Absolutely, like a real shift on 100%. on 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 at a change in in the culture, right? In in newsrooms and just the way of thinking. And when you look at fundraising, my goodness, like Kickstarter really just changed the way that um, so many people are now supporting um, startups and and social good. Yeah. Uh, so how did it what's all up, begin? What's up, y'all? Nice to see you. Yeah, uh, take us back there. Uh, well, 2007, I was actually working as the editor in chief of a music magazine. Um, so that's what you expected to hear, I'm sure. Uh, but yeah, uh, 
platform called eMusic. It was the first music subscription service in my life before Kickstarters. I was a music critic for eight years, writing for The Voice and City Pages and Spin, Entertainment Weekly, things like that, uh, just reviewing records. And so that was my, that was my life at the time. Uh, but a couple of years before that, in 2005, I had met a uh, person who's my co-founder in Kickstarter, one of my two co-founders, Perry Chen, when he was working as a waiter in a restaurant where I was a regular. And he had had this idea of a new way to fund creative projects. You propose an idea online. People put up their credit cards, but no one is charged unless it sells out. Um, and so we decided to start working on that. But I came from that as a, as a writer and as a person who cared about those things. And um, yeah, so I think I'm representing the, I'm standing in the utopian corner for the internet. I mean, I think Kickstarter is a very <laughs> utopian product, right? Like anybody with an idea, Anybody can put up the money. There's like verification systems, et cetera, but it's largely based on trust and an honor system. And it works fabulously. You know, three and a half billion dollars changing hands based on trust and enthusiasm for new ideas. So, you know, I think that the utopian uh, dream is alive and well. It's just overshadowed by monopolistic corporatization and heavy control and that uh, is going to undo us unless we think of a way out of it. We were talking about this on the phone a little bit the other day about this idea of whether, um, to me, what has happened in the last 10 years seems to make very much sense. And I don't come from a tech background, to be perfectly frank about it. But if you open something up and, and you have an optimism that this means that people can communicate more with each other dark corners of the world can, can actually, information can come from there, people can connect in different ways. Those are all very great things, and I think a ton of that has actually happened over the last 10 years. But, but those same, that same power that's inherent in that, obviously people who want to spread misinformation and people who want to uh, manipulate information, they have the same access to that. And so it's, to me it's much more the last 10 years are, like the battle is joined right, much more than there was going to be a utopia and that was just going to be the absolute sort of outcome of it. I mean, I, I find that my own organization is incredibly more transparent than it was 10 years ago. It's probably not nearly as transparent as it needs to be, but in terms of whether the folks who interact with our journalism, whether they have more of a say in, in what we do and, and if they have more influence on, on how we think, Absolutely, 100%. It's, it's like night and day to me. And, and I think that's what the point of it was, was to give a bigger voice to everyone. Yeah, it's funny that, I don't think that you were saying this, but I think that there is a sense that um, like there are wrong voices out there or dis right. discourse is broken, right. uh, which is amazing considering like these are just all ideas that live in the minds of human beings. And the idea of like some of those things, it's just, it's a hard, it's a hard place to draw a line. Um, and we're just simply being exposed to what's actually there. And, you know, I was thinking about this today. Like, um, like these ins like institutions are very. Uh, all of our institutions in America are based on uh, a shared sense of values that is either implicit or explicit. Like every institution depends on. Like there's six things we all agree we're going to do here. We don't lie. We don't whatever. We don't murder each other. There's some basic uh, set of things, and. Right now, it feels like we're lacking that in culture completely, and um, in, in American culture in particular. But then, you know, I was thinking, actually, well, when we look at our, the Constitution as our values, actually, maybe we're killing it mm -hmm. according to our values. What are the top two American values according to the US Constitution? Freedom of speech and right to bear arms. <laughs> maybe this is America at its most Americist. You know, like number three, no soldiers are living in our homes. Like, check on that, too. So maybe. <laughs> Maybe this is the plan, and maybe, and maybe it's just that uh, the folly of mankind, the way that we build systems, the way, that, the way that we try to force order and a simple model upon a world where there is no such thing, is it going to produce these things that are very uncomfortable for us, very yeah. challenging for us, but they're right. all true. And, I mean, I think, uh, I, think, so I think that's a really good point, and I also think that, you know, um, when you talk about something like, do people believe in facts anymore, right? And, and I've been in a, I'm sure you all have too, a lot of seminars the last year where it's like facts, no one, no one in the world believes in facts. 
And I mean, there's a lot of people in the world who believe in facts, okay? And, and there's clearly a couple of folks right now who, um, for various reasons, have decided that they don't want to believe in some facts or something like that. But that's just the truth of our, that's just like the truth of our world. That's, that's not, to me, something that means, I, I'm not expressing myself very well, but there are a lot of people who seek out factual information when it is important to them, hmm. okay? And I mean, if you go and buy a car, you want to know what the car's price is, what the loan bill, you know, capabilities that you can get. You seek out factual information. And so it's, I don't see much evidence that people don't seek out facts. I do see evidence that, that sometimes they don't believe the messenger and, and, and they don't, uh, they want, um, or, or for some reason they decide not to believe specific facts. Often those are for political reasons. Um, but to me, that's sort of, I, I kind of get a kick out of the idea that, you know, we all worry that trust in institutions is, is falling. I think it's good for institutions to have to, to, to regain that trust every minute, right? I would rather work for an institution that every day has to go out there and say, this is why you should trust us today, because this is what we did today. And I think that's a healthy thing. It's got a, there's a lot of pain around it, and we've all lived through a lot of pain. There's no question about that. And there are a lot of folks who are actively trying to move around dangerous misinformation in our world. And we're very focused on America, but there's a lot of, um, I think the Rohingya thing that's going on right now is a, is a fascinating and very scary, but also illuminating example of the dangers loose in our world in terms of, do you believe in eyewitness information? How do you need to know that it's eyewitness information? What is the level of proof that you need to know that it's eye eyewitness information? But those are all really interesting and important questions for, to, for us to grapple with going forward. I, you know, what I, what, I, what I think when I hear you say these things is about um, that I think there's a difference and a tension between fact and truth. Mm -hmm. And that um, you, can, you, can re, you can read an article that is full of, that has all facts and contains mm -hmm. no truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think truth is more emotional Truth is more melodramatic. Truth is not just rationality. Truth is feeling. Truth is history. Mm -hmm. Truth is acknowledging whatever the broader scope of things. And I think truth is more important than facts, but it's harder. It's harder. Definitely. It, 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 it exposes the relativism of all life. Right. And, That's and, right. And, and, and like, I think a lot of the things that we may be saying, oh, people aren't listening to the right facts, that may be true. It's it also possible that they might be listening to the right deeper truth, mm -hmm. and it's it's hard to know where like which is which. But I don't like I think if we knew everything, right? If we knew every fact in the universe, there, this is no different. We're in the exact same position because it's about it's about it's about something deeper than fact. Right. Well, which is why journalism plays such an important role in providing context. Right. And so, if ten years ago the internet created incredible like culture change inside newsrooms and just democratized the way that people could contribute and support artists and then startups and mm -hmm. now your latest feature at, at Kickstarter. Um, looking ahead, how might um, the internet help support journalism, help support trust in, in media, in information, in news? Well, we have a whole. Uh, well, you know, um, it it begins by getting people out of the feeds. Um, every day, every moment that you spend uh, swimming in a feed of other people's thoughts, like you are stuck in mud. You are not going to go anywhere. Um, like there's no there's no truth in feeds. There's facts in feeds. Uh, like I, I found myself recently wanting like a uh, an editorial publication that only has like a ten year horizon. Like it only reports on things that started at least ten years ago, so we can actually know the reality. It's not just a press release of it launched. It's like what is the what is that? Is that a is that a real thing? Is that a not a real thing? But it's just from it's just it's just a it takes a willful separation from from networks and feeds that are uh, just creating a hive mind of mushy nothingness in your brain uh, and finding a way to be separate from it. And I, I think that's what, that's what great 
any great thinking, whether it's philosophy or journalism or a great film, does. But I think that, to me, is still where we are trying to get people. Sounds like the printed version of newspapers. <laughs> um, I think there's a lot of that already going on. I felt much less optimistic about the future of how journalism was going to make money um, and keep it, well, not make money, but keep itself going, self fund itself, okay? Five years ago than I did now. I feel much more optimistic about that. I don't feel totally optimistic about it. I think there's a lot of completely uh, rocky roads still ahead, but I think there's some. There's like some little shoots shooting up. One of them is nonprofit journalism, um, or 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 you know, uh, disinterested philanthropies trying to you know push investigative reporting. I agree that I think geographic diversity and and like states in the U.S. and pockets of overseas are the are the neglected places and the places where hopefully a lot of the future sort of you know interest in this goes. Um, I had this fascinating sort of fight with two of my um, relatives a couple of years ago at the Thanksgiving dinner table. This was before our families had fights at Thanksgiving dinner table. We always had them anyway. But <laughs> they were they both um, work for um, um, very prominent technology companies in America, and they were both essentially internet utopians. And I love them both very dearly. But they were um, talking to me about how all information should be free. And at that point, I was in Cairo. And I was trying like mad to take my tiny little news budget and cover a war that the United States of America was involved in, in Iraq. And I was like, information is not free. Good information is not free. I'm sorry. I've got to keep people safe in Baghdad. And I have to be able to get them to report news for you to know what's going on in Baghdad. And if you think that you don't need me and you just need a blogger, then that blogger needs to have a, a you know, I'm not, I'm not speaking that you have to believe in old fashioned news organizations. But someone's got to be there as an independent observer and an independent voice and tell you what's really going on in that country. Because if you think that either the Iraqi government or the terrorists or the US government are giving you the full truth, that's not the case. Okay? And I, I was really angry at them that they thought that they could get information and they didn't understand that it actually created re it needed resources to create information. So in the last year, both of those relatives have said to me that they understand the difference. There's a difference now between, I call it good information and bad information. Let's say something. Let's say <laughs> fact-based journalism and non-fact-based journalism. Well, and I, I agree that there's a difference between facts and truth, but I think facts are an incredibly important underpinning <laughs> to truth. As, as long as there are <laughs> billionaires in the world, media will be easy to fund. Right? I mean, why not? Why not buy your own newspaper or publication yeah, but or whatever. They, they might want their own, they might want to influence it in ways. Yeah, exactly, of course, right. that's why. That's why they'll do it. But I think about like what is, like what is, like how about, um, you know, how about Gawker and Gothamist in DNA Info? Like how about three of like the early pillars of web publishing, you know, murdered? Got murdered, it. not because that they weren't providing value, because they, were providing value, or be, you know, or they agitated for something more, um, but just gone. Like that just happens. We're all going like, oh, that's no big deal. Gawker was terrible. Whatever got the mist. It was clickbaity sometimes. Whatever. I can find Tompkins Square dog parade Halloween pictures somewhere else. Uh, <laughs> but um, but yeah, I mean, that's coming. That's not stopping. That's like, oh, that just happened those couple times in 2016, 2017. No, that's. That's a wave that's going to continue. But Yancy, you can just share with us like tremendous insights about what you've learned about crowdfunding um, at Kickstarter and and how might what you've learned since 2007 well, about the way and what people will support. Yeah. Um, um, what what lessons might be applied it's, uh, uh, to support quality cr journalism? Cr you know, crowd crowdfunding is a is a solution of many solutions. Um, I would, I would maybe take a step back and think about um, what you get out of that and what and what Kickstarter has, which is just uh, the lesson is you, you know, you have to be your own bitch. Like someone's going to control you, someone is going to write a check for you. Like as much as you are in control of that, and not someone who you're not, you know, close with. Like 
that makes the biggest difference. Um, and so I think that means, that does mean charging for things, that does, or it just means not paying yourself, or guess what, y'all, like, none of us are making money on this, we're just doing it to do it. Uh, but there have to be a trade-off there. If the trade-off you're making is, oh no, we're gonna get a lot of money, and we're just gonna like grow ourselves away to where we can mm -hmm. be powerful and do whatever you want, you know, that's never gonna work. You're always selling something, and if it's your soul, you should know it from the beginning. So as it, so, <laughs> Very so nice. you uh, came to Kickstarter as a as a music critic, as a, as an artist with a real appreciation. What might journalists and journalism learn from artists? Um, well, you know, I think it's maybe um, it's about having a clear vision of difference. Um, you know, as an artist, your practice is about like what is, what is unique about you. You know, you're in a market of there's like okay, there's a billion painters. Who cares? But like what what is that specific angle? And then like just owning that so hard, you know, just it's, it only becomes about difference. And that's how you build an identity. And that's how you build a brand. And you could try to do that by saying like, we're everything to everybody, come, whatever. Like no one believes you. Weirdly, the more specific you are, charging $400 a year for the information, like that's attractive. Like, oh, that person seems so confident. They know what's going on. I want to be a part of what they're doing. So. It's like taking a harder, bolder stand and being willing to sacrifice. There's a, uh, the law of sacrifice is something I believe in. If you want to get something for people, you got to give something up. And, and so if that's trust, then that means there are other things you're going to have to trade on. And maybe that nice office and flat iron and the nice 20-inch monitors for your designers is something you're not going to be able to afford. And Sally, we just have a, a minute or so left looking into the future. Let me see, Yancey, looking into the future, you're stepping down as CEO of uh, Kickstarter. Is there a newspaper in your future to own and to guide? The, the Yancey Gazette publishes <laughs> daily. Uh, uh, it will have a no, big music but, section. No, but, um, but I, uh, I'm convinced we, uh, our, even our new ideas are too old. Hmm. And, uh, and, and I, I I believe very strongly we need, we need very different ways to think about the future. And, um, and that is, uh, that's what I'm about. And so there's more to come from me on that. Great, and Sally, on a note of optimism as the last panel. Uh, the way I would did. express that, I, I think that um, what I think is important going forward is I agree completely that the pace of change almost has to increase more dramatically than less dramatically. And, but what, what I've been trying to think and, and to somehow find ways to express is that the values of organizations, like my organization, stay exactly the same. I, I don't want to change the values of my, it's, it's accuracy, it's facts, it's fairness, it's, it's those sorts of things. And I don't want to change my, the values of my organization, but I want to change the nimbleness and the, and the, the way we communicate, the accessibility, the, all the things that, are, that you're sort of talking about, the approach to the world. All of that, I think, is the place where we need to, to put our best folks in our, and think and change. And, and I've found that that, you know, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm curious how to express that the best way so that it, it really captures that. That's sort of the very optimistic but also difficult challenge that I see ahead of us, though. So. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.